And this evening, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 13, and uh, we'll be looking at the first 13 verses, all right? And uh, we're going to be dealing with, okay, one of the dark, one of the very dark chapters, actually, of the, of the Bible, all right? And uh, we'll deal with this question of falling in love or lust, which is it? And the question is, do you and I know, all right? And we're going to be in um, this text here. And let me just uh, bring this up. Okay. And I'm going to read this. All right. Um, okay, begin verse 1. And it came to pass after, th after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. And he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Will thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. And may God bless to us the reading of his word. And let's pray. Father, thank you for even this uh, reading of the scriptures. Lord, I pray that you just use even this text. And Lord, use me even as your servant uh, as I preach this. And Lord, uh, may it open our eyes of understanding. And Lord, um, just empower me also right now. And we ask this in Christ's name, pray. Amen. Okay, and so we come to okay, chapter 13, and here, right, as we came, to, okay, we went through chapter 12, and this was when David's uh, sin of adultery was exposed. Now, it was told to him that um, what's going to happen from this point on, he was not going to have peace in his family, that the sword would be there, you know, he's going to uh, actually see, uh, there'll be certain things that's going to happen uh, to his family. Right, the sword will not depart from his family, and and so he's going to now see, understand and taste firsthand, right, what it's like to actually lose someone that you love. Okay, the same way that he brought that upon Bathsheba, and first step was already um, the first chapter was already when uh, the son, right, that was born, the child that was born out of that adulterous relationship, right, died, and the Lord took him. Okay, took him home. And then now we're going to see more and more, right? David's family disintegrate, right? Just as David had broken up a home and a marriage, right? And destroyed relationships in the process, all right? Now this is going to happen within his family. It's going to fracture. It's going to break apart. And it's going to cause immense amount of pain, all right? And God is not mocked, right? Because uh, whatsoever man... Okay, will so okay, he's going to reap that. And whatever God says will happen, it's going to happen. All right, God is not uh he doesn't just say things in in an idle manner. Alright, so we come to this chapter here. And so we uh, now introduce uh we see the beginning with uh, my first point, the desire of Amnon. Alright? Is it and it came to pass, right, that Absalom, okay, the uh Okay, we see that here that uh Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. Okay, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So, um, we, we are introduced to some of the members of David's family, his children. Okay, and one of the sons of David is Absalom. All right, this is actually his third son. Uh, David had multiple wives and, you know, uh, the, you know, children from each of these wives. Now, so, and, and, you know, even the things that uh, happened to David now, should serve as a warning here that polygamy was never God's plan. Okay, and with multiple wives and multiple you know, children from different wives, there's going to be a lot of very complicated things. Okay, and here, all right, we're going to see here that Absalom had a fair sister. Now, the idea here was that uh, she was very beautiful. Okay, 
Uh, she had great beauty. Uh, it was noted by you know people who take took notice of that. Okay, and and Amnon, the son of David, okay, fell in love with her. Now, according to verse two, this was to the ex okay to the extent that um he was vexed, right, and and and, and he fell sick for his sister Tamar, literally love sick. Okay. And then it says, for she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So basically, Amnon wanted to uh, be able to spend time with her, to be alone with her, to get to know her, you know, uh, and, you know, to do things that, uh, you know, young men and young women want to do when they're on a date, you know, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but he found that uh, there was no opportunity. It was not easy. And given the, I think the very, you know, open public nature, I think, of uh, of a family that's living as a as the royal family in, before the court, right? The royal court. Um, this was not going to be something that can happen, not without causing a major scandal. Now we look at the name Amnon and it means faithful. Okay, he's the eldest son of David. So literally he's going to be the future king. Right? He's the first in line for the throne after David. Now Tema, her name simply means a palm tree. Okay, and she's Absalom's uh, younger sister. Okay, so now in the Middle East, uh, Eastern type cultures, also the okay the older brothers take on the responsibility of looking out for the younger sister, right? Uh, watching over them, protecting them. Okay, uh, protecting their purity also. And here, Absalom, his name means peaceful. Okay, peaceful. Um. When you look at some of the some of the names here, right? Faith, uh, Amnon and and Absalom, faithful and peaceful, and you know there's a bit of an irony to this when you look at the the lives and how everything turned out. Okay, Absalom's life was anything but peaceful, right? Full of turmoil, full of violence, full, and all that, and you know, uh, you know, and then you know this thing with Amnon and what he he had done. Now both Tema and Absalom were very well known for their beauty, right? B both by male, not just by, okay, Tema by female standards and, you know, Absalom by male standards were considered extremely beautiful and handsome, right? Uh, as young women and young men. Now, here we see um, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, uh, chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, uh, some mention about the names of, uh, David's children. It says, And unto David was sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam the Jezreelites, and his second, Chileab of Abigail, the wife of Nabal. All right, and take note of the name Nabal there, okay, or uh, the Camelite. And the third, Absalom, the son of Makkah, okay, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. Okay, and so we see. Here, yeah, actually, uh, Absalom, uh, okay, his mother is actually a, a not a, okay, not Jewish, all right, it's a, uh, the Gentile. And um, so Absalom is third in line, okay, for the throne. Um, if you're familiar with various uh, kind of uh, period dramas and, and you know, uh, example, Korean dramas and whatever, you're going to see um, there's always people vying to see who could, who's in line for, to be the king, you know, and, and the rivals, and they're trying to get rid of each other and all those kind of things. Now, okay, now there's, behind the scenes, okay, there's always going to be this simply because of the sin, sinful and human nature. But I want to talk about one thing here, which is when you look at this chapter, okay, and the more uh, I got into a deeper study, I started to see one thing, how David sins and the things that he had done are now coming to haunt him. Okay, the things that he had done, he had done to others, okay, are now going to happen to him. Think about this. David lasted after Bathsheba's beauty and ended up killing her husband. What happens now? Amnon lasts after Tamar's beauty, right, and then violently robs her of her purity. Okay? What we're going to see you know, further down will be that, uh, you know, Amnon actually gets killed, right? 
Amnon abuses his power and position to actually commit rape, thinking that he could get away with it. Just like David did in seducing Bathsheba, right, and committing adultery in the process. Now, all in all, what we're going to see here is that David's chickens have now come home to roost. Okay? And everything that he has done, okay, he's going to start to reap. And it's going to be a very painful process over a period of time. Now, coming to the subject of beauty, okay, Proverbs 31 verse 30 tells us, like, favor is deceitful, okay, and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Okay, realize this that, um, yes, with beauty, beauty can open a lot of doors. Okay, it can create a lot of opportunities. But that favor can also be very deceitful and, and, can, and you can get to your head, all right, and it can make you think that you're something, someone, someone bigger and better than you really are. And the thing is this, all right, beauty can be either a blessing or a curse. And sometimes it's both. How a woman handles this is going to say a lot about the kind of person she is. It will, it will reveal her character. Okay? But at the same time, I want to notice here is this, right? Because in this chapter, we're going to see the rape of Tema. And it's important for us to realize, right, that rape is not the victim's fault. Okay, it is a sin, a terrible and heinous sin, sin is inflicted upon somebody, right? Not by, cho- not by choice, okay? And it is a premeditated act. And this is not an act of love. This is an act of hatred, okay? And here, but realize this, okay? Beauty, because in our culture today, okay, we've taken that and elevated that to an extent where it goes far beyond just being a blessing to become maybe even the, a primary thing. And the thing we need to ask ourselves, is, is that right? Okay, what should be the right balance? Look at Proverbs 11 verse 22. Now it says, as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. Imagine the, you know, the pig snout and then there's a jewel of gold over there. It says, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. Now there's a woman without discretion is like um, a jewel all right, or putting jewelry in the snout of a pig. All right? They don't match. They don't come together. Is incongruous, right? It, it's just, and the word discretion here, right, means taste or judgment. Or in today's terms in our culture, right, basically it means no class. You know, something tacky, uh, you know, crass behavior. In other words, beauty without refinement, right, uh, or without character is extremely ugly. Okay, and th- this is the timeless wisdom right, from King Solomon, passed down to us, right, recorded in the scriptures, okay, it's just like putting a, some expensive jewelry in the snout of a pig, okay, so just because you have beauty, right, if you're, uh, for instance, a person, a woman without discretion, okay, it, 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 they don't go together. Now, we've been warned in the scriptures in Proverbs 6 verse 25, right, last not after her beauty in thine heart, Right, the very thing that Amnon did. And neither let her take thee with her eyelids. Okay, and we need to be careful here that um, as much as our society today, our culture, modern day culture, is highly sexualized. Okay, that is not the only thing that will attract or, or draw a man. And that's why here the warning to men was this: last not after her beauty. In thine heart, right? Um, you know, being a fan of somebody, right? And then, uh, is this here? Is it even the attention to the eyes? Okay, this is not even. A, okay, nowhere here do you see anything about skimpy clothing or you know sensual clothing. Is this even the eyelids? Right, the things that you know. Uh, uh, so, so the allure and the attraction can be. You know, in the overall beauty, the face, the hair, the eyes. And so, the, the warning goes far beyond just sexual lust. 
right? But our culture today, of course, as you know, is fixated primarily on the external and cosmetic beauty. Now, the thing that comes with beauty is, as I mentioned, it can be a blessing, okay? And realize this, God is a, a creator God, created all things bright and beautiful, all, all creatures great and small. You know, he, 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 he's good on the aesthetics. But the problem in the world that we live in today is that uh, it can also bring upon a lot of unwanted and inappropriate attention and intentions also by men. You know, God put beauty in women in such a way that um, men, especially the husband, uh, you know, is visually drawn to her and is attracted to her and, you know, he, he appreciates what he sees. Okay? And, but the thing is this, it can also draw a lot of unwanted attention. And, you know, we, uh, as fathers, I mean, some, there were times we were just joking around, we were saying, yeah, look, uh, when so-and-so grows up, I think, you know, like brother so-and-so, I, I'm going to help you load the shotgun and just to make sure we keep, you know, all, the, all, the, all these uh, un, unwanted men at bay. All right? And, but when you go back to biblical times, you're going to see actually the older brothers take on that job. All right? Or watching over, guarding, and protecting their younger sisters. Okay? So let's move on. And as we deal with, with this whole thing, right? Now, Amnon was claimed to be in love, right? And what we're going to see here is that he is confused about the difference between love and lust. He wanted Tamar. He wanted to be alone with her. No, he wanted her sexually. And the scriptures records for us, this is because, this is for she was a virgin. Okay, untouched, pure, innocent. And the goal was to get alone with her in an intimate setting. Now, that corresponds a lot today with the dating culture, right, that we've had with us for the last, about at least half a century now. Okay, where two people, in trying to get to know each other, what do they do? They isolate themselves, get themselves away from other people, and then just to do, uh, explore activities that are actually intended for a husband and wife. Okay, and then hoping that there are no consequences and consequences do not apply to them, right? And that's very foolish. Now, here, Amnon wanted that, and this is with his half-sister, okay? It's a, his, 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 this is actually his sister, but from a different mother. And now, and again, I want us to see the parallel here because David also sought for a way to be alone with Bathsheba, um, back in the earlier chapter, all right, I think it was it uh, chapter eleven. And why was this the case? Because once you're alone and there's nobody else, you know. I, I, years back, there was this song. I think we're alone now, with the implication that what this opens the door for us to do things that we normally would not be able to do if we're not alone. Okay, and as you know, that always is going to be something inappropriate. Okay, now for these two men, right, whether it's David or Amnon, it was something of a compulsion. They had to do this. David went to a, you know, extreme means to make sure that he could be alone with Bathsheba and then to cover it up, uh, he went to, to the point of trying to, to cover up the pregnancy and all that. He, he went through a lot of elaborate schemes before eventually killing, right, getting Uriah killed. Now, Amnon is right at the starting point, he, the things that he would like to do, but he cannot, right? Because um, people will know, people will see, and how can he do those things unless he was alone? And, you know, you go back and I think if you just do a, a search, for instance, are there songs, there'll be all sorts of songs that were, no, how do I get you alone? You know, how, how, and, and why? Because again, in the, under the cloak of privacy or under the cloak of darkness, uh, Men and women feel free to be able to do things that they dare not do otherwise. Now, if you look at verse 3 and 4, so in this problem, we now introduce another person, all right, called Jonadab. And we see the design of Jonadab, all right? He devises a plan. And here's a, so it tells us here, but 
Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, right? The son of Shimei, David's brother. Okay, so in other words, um, so they're kind of like cousins. Yeah, they're going to be cousins, right? Because this is uh, David's brother, uh, the son of David's brother. So Amnon had this friend, his close friends, good buddies, and others with, uh, okay, with Jonadab. And then we are in, given another description here. It says, and Jonadab was a very subtle man. It didn't say he was, uh, that he was a subtle man. He says he was very. Okay, and here it says, and he said unto him, why art thou, okay, in other words, why are you, right? It says, being the king's son, leaned from day to day. Okay, here's, the idea here is he's thin, you know, he's weak, right, physically. You know, is that, why are you in this kind of physical state? Okay, is it, will thou not tell me? Is it, please tell me. I'm right. I'm, I'm your close friend, my good friend. Tell me what's bugging you. And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Now, so here's this, right? So here's this Amnon. He's in love and he's literally lovesick uh, to the point it shows on his face, you know, and, and, and uh, Jonah that comes up and say, hey, why are you looking like that? Well, you know, why, you know, and you and you know if you look around, you know, and, and when we're younger, some of us when we're younger, you you know when you have a friend, you know, someone in school, whoever your classmate, whoever, and uh, who's fallen in love or who's lovesick because you can see it in their face. You know, they they, they zoned out, they're daydreaming. You know, they they walk into walls. You know, they got this silly grin on their face and so on and so forth. Now, here in the case of Amnon, he's like lovesick. He can't eat. Right, he can't sleep. You know, he's not quite there, and so, so uh, Jonadab says, "Okay, tell me what's the problem, right?" And so he says, "Okay, uh, and but notice one thing he said here. He said, why, why are you going through all this, right? When you're the king's son, okay, he is the king's son, right? He he ought to be, you know, healthy, well fed, you know, whatever, and now." But look at the description, right? Jonadab was a subtle man. And he was also a close confidant to Amnon. And the word subtle, okay? Um, here, this guy was sly. He was cunning. Okay? Um, some would say he, he's sharp. Okay? But here was someone who when you use those terms to describe him, this is not in the positive. Okay? He's sharper than the average person, but how he uses that, right, you know, that intelligence and all that, uh, you know, it's not necessarily for good. But he points out, right, and he, so here's this guy, he comes, he tells Amnon, he said, look, you're the king's son, why do you have to suffer like this? You know, in this kind of heartache. And there is an implication here that, look, you're the king's son. You can do anything you want. And you can get away with it. Can I put it to you that, you know, the wrong kind of friends can, okay, cause trouble. Not because if we don't have those friends, then nothing will happen. No, because the problem is already in us. But the wrong kind of friends can amplify and reinforce the desires that are in us. Right, the kind of things that we want to do in, in us. And they, you know, because it, they lend the kind of moral support that we, uh, we need in order to get into all sorts of foolishness and all that. Now, the wrong kind of friends and the, and the wrong kind of people that you and I consult with, okay, can lead us into trouble and mislead us. Case in point, Genesis chapter 3, you start talking to the serpent in the garden and guess what? That was the first example of the serpent of someone gaslighting somebody else, manipulating someone else with, you know, with half truths or incomplete information, and then after that with insinuation, All right? Samson uh, had friends and his, his wife in particular. Now you, ex you know, you, you look at what kind of friends, okay? Who are the close friends of a person? All right? 
May I remind everyone that the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed by a friend that he had trusted. Okay? Even the Apostle Paul talked about how his life was in danger from false brethren. Now, here the wrong kind of friends can create very serious problems, especially those that we, who we go to to seek advice, right? To seek counsel. Okay? So, um, he was a subtle man, right? he's a confidant to Amnon, and as the king's son, the point he was trying to make, right, he didn't have to suffer this kind of heartache, why? Because he can do whatever he likes, he can get away with his actions, and the point was that he didn't need to, he will not suffer consequences, because why? He's a king's son, he's in a privileged position, right, he is in a powerful position, he is going to be, right, the new king. I think the term probably that they will use will be he's the crown prince, right? He's going to be the future king. But wrong friends can create problems for us as we, we saw just now. And notice 1 Corinthians 15 verse uh, 33 tells us, warns us, says, right? Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. All right? The kind of exposure, the kind of uh, uh, intercourse, right? In terms, of, in terms of friendships, fellowships, and uh, okay, people we hang out with, whom we seek advice from and counsel. Now, it can corrupt, okay, your character. Now, one of the reasons why that happens is simply because people have a tendency, right, to pick close friends that are most similar to themselves. That's why we have that saying, right, birds of a feather flock together. Okay, you want to know, okay, the kind of people that uh, kind of are drawn to each other, and they, it's not just about how much they laugh and they, they have meals together. There has to be similarities in character and the kind of person that they are, that to to draw, have that draw and have that bond, to want to spend more time together. Now that's going to reveal something about the person, right? Uh, who do who, the kind? Who do we get advice from? Right, that's going to reveal something about our character. Um, you know, spiritually, the kind of close friendships we have is going to tell us something about what you believe about the Bible, even about your doctrine and your practice. Now, John the Depp comes along in verse 5. Now, he devises this wicked plan and tells it to uh, Amnon. Right, it says, and John the Depp said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed, okay, and make thyself sick. Now just pretend to be sick. Right? Use deceit, uh, lie to everyone, all right, put on a pretense, and so weapons, draw attention. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tema come and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. Right? So he's gonna make himself so sick that um David, as king, will drop whatever he's doing, come down, he's going to be very, very concerned. It's like, oh, what happened, you know? And it's like, oh, I'm dying, I'm dying, oh. Right? And, and then the, his father's going to come and say, okay, what can I do? I say, oh, no, I need my sister to come and she just makes me some cakes and things, you know, and let me, you know, let her feed me this thing, right? I will eat it out of her hand, kind of like a puppy or a, a kitten. And imagine this design, this wicked plan, uh, all was a ruse so that Amnon can be alone, right, with Tema. Okay? He just wants some alone time. And he comes up with this thing and covers up his intentions, right, to the point of deceiving David, his very own father. Now, once again, you're going to see David co covered up his adultery right through deceit and murder. Now, Amnon deceives his own father to cover up for his scheme. And he's got this plan here. He wants to get alone with his half-sister. You know, things have a way of coming back to us. Jacob fooled his father, Isaac. Guess what happened? He ran over for, he ran for his life because his brother was, Esau was going to kill him. Goes to his uncle Laban and then gets into a you know business arrangement with Laban and his uncle basically tricks him 
cons him multiple times in return. Right? Things have a way of coming back. And so we need to be very careful here. And, and we see there is a pattern and all these things are now surfacing up. All right, and coming back to David, for David to learn firsthand the pain, the destructiveness of sin, uh, and you know what other people went through, David's going to go through now. All right, go through with this. And so beware of sly and cunning people and their words. All right, because in Genesis uh, chapter 3, look at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, all right, had God said, you shall not drink, eat of every tree of the garden. And you notice, this word subtle, um, you know, you see this word show up multiple times in the Bible. And, you know, when it's used as a description, it is not something flattering. Okay? It is not good. All right? Our world today you know, we'll put a premium on intelligence, right? How smart someone is. But be careful because the kind of wisdom you have is important, right? Do you get your wisdom from God or is this worldly wisdom, right? Beware because, again, here the serpent was the one giving advice to the woman, right, in the Garden of Eden. And, you know, look at where that got us. Right, Jonadab, a subtle man, was now didn't say he was a subtle man. He said he was a very subtle man. Okay, above all else, this was the thing that described him. Right, he's giving advice to Amnon. Right, beware, because even in our churches, a worldly wise man, and there are many that actually go about, and you know, you you know, because when the moment they speak, okay, this you you can you will realize. The advice and the counsel they give you, you cannot go back to any chapter and verse from the Bible because this is, they'll tell you, Here, here's what I think, you know, oh, let me tell you, okay? Uh, you know, let me give you the benefit of my experience. And and they're never going to go to the Bible. Beware of men, okay, people like that. Because look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 19 to 20. It says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Right, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Can you imagine that God is wiser and craftier than you? Right, even the most crafty person, God can outwit them. It says, and again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain, empty. Okay, uh, elsewhere in Romans, what happens is it professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And the wisdom of this world, okay, it's not something God is impressed with. Okay, I'm not impressed with people who are, you know, who are constantly trying to show me how smart, how intellectual they are. Because unless you're getting your wisdom from the word of God, you know something? It's vain. Who cares? All right. And it's always going to be replaced with something else along the way because there are always going to be new books, new thoughts, new ideas all the time. All right, beware of the wisdom of the lost. 1 Corinthians 1, look at verse 21. For that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom, right? This is talking about worldly wisdom, knew not God. Okay, the world got became lost actually in the process because of their worldly wisdom. He said it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay, so this is not something that uh, God cares very much about, all right? The wisdom of men nothing the greatest intellect okay that ever lived okay it doesn't matter whether it's einstein or stephen hawking whatever it's nothing as far as god is concerned now your close relationships will reveal the kind of person that you are because why two cannot walk together except they be agreed all right amos 3 verse 3 can two walk together except they be agreed so and this is not coming from the outside in, you know, it's from the inside out. Who you are from the inside is going to resonate. It's going to connect with the other person. And he's going to say something about who you and I are. And that's why we have to ask this question, right? What kind of people are your closest friends? The ones that you confide in? The ones that you go to for counsel and advice? Because that will tell me something about who you are. 
Okay? The kind of person that you are. Okay? So, something to think about. Now, we come to the third point here, the disorder of Amnon, right? Now, he's going to go and execute this plan. And so, Amnon deceives his father, David. Verse 6, so Amnon lay down and made himself sick. Okay, because he was not sick, he made himself sick. Okay, he simulates his illness. He feigns his illness. And when the king was come to see him, Amnon said unto the king, I pray thee, let Tamar, my sister, come and make, and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat at her hand. Okay, so apparently uh, she's good at making certain types of cakes and things. And he says, oh, can you have her come over, right? Uh, to take care of me in the midst of, and you know I don't I don't know Amnon being the oldest brother here suddenly is like acting like a big baby right and so he wants his you know, little sister to come uh, to do all those things and, said, and, and then so that she can just you know just feed me and I'll just eat out of her hand and then I'll be well I'm gonna feel so much better and so he feigns this illness in order to get sympathy to rest in bed now again there's a very interesting parallel because David lay in bed all day in the palace right in the beginning of chapter 11 and it wasn't just to rest right he was in bed all day finally got up in the evening was bored was looking around for some excitement something interesting when he ought to be at work right at the time when kings uh, was supposed to go to war he stayed back he was hanging around in the palace now guess guess what Amnon does the same thing as dad Okay. And as I mentioned, his deeds, and the things that David did, right? His deeds are now being done. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Are now being done to him. Right. I got a typo there. And so point number four, you see the duty assigned by David. Look at verse seven and eight. Then David sent home to Tamar, right? He sends a message there. He gives instructions saying, go now to thy brother Amnon's house and dress for him meat. All right? Cook something for him, you know, feed him. So, so Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house. All right? Innocently, she goes there and, says, and, she, and he was laid down and she took flour and kneaded it and made cakes in his side and he did and did bake the cakes. Okay? So, you see something about Tamar. All right? David, uh, her father gives her instructions, go, do this. She immediately obeys, right? Uh, she obeys her father. She goes there and she cares for her brother, right? She can, uh, okay, she knows how to cook and, and you know, and bake and do, do these things. And what happens? David, right, the one who sent Uriah into a death trap, now inadvertently sends his beloved daughter into an ambush. Right? Think about this. How, how all the chickens have come back to roost. He was the one that set up Uriah. Guess what? He is now unwittingly part of a plan to set up his daughter, Tamar. Alright? For something really bad. And realize this, that whatsoever we sow, we are also going to reap. Right? That's why Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Be not deceived. Why? Because we're not going to get away with this. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And this is a spiritual law. Okay? And this principle of sowing and reaping, you know, it's going to repeat itself. Okay? If we don't learn this. Alright? David is going to reap now. The very same thing that he, you know, he had done, guess what? It's going to happen to him and his family. Just that what he did affected Bathsheba's family. Now, this is going to be repaid to him. He's going to, he's going to reap this within his own family. Okay? David is going to ex experience the pain of personal loss and tragedy. Okay? Tamar is going to be raped and robbed of her innocence by Amnon, her, okay, the future king. Now, when you look at that, that I start to see a parallel because... And I'm, I'm asking the question, right? Now, was Bathsheba seduced by David while he, as king, exploited his power and his position? Just as now, the, his eldest son, right? The future king, Amnon, was going to use the same thing, thinking that he has immunity. 
right? That uh, if anything happens, no one is going to be able to judge him. No one is ever going to make him call, be called, going to call him to account. And so he's going to, he, he's thinking that he could get away with this. And so he can do anything he wants, including even raping his own half-sister. All right? No, but guess what? David thought he could do anything he wanted. He's, he was the king, including taking another man's wife. And then if there was any objection to that, he would, you know, just to cover up, he could get that, uh, the husband of that woman killed. Okay? And, and we're going to see in later chapters that that may seem to be the case, right? Because uh, vengeance was actually, uh, okay, was sought and, and was inflicted, right, by members of Bathsheba's family, right, for what he had done. Okay, but we'll get there later, right, some weeks down the road. But let's continue where we are. Let's go to, uh, okay, verse 9 and 10. Okay, because we see the drawing into the trap. Verse 9 and 10 says, And she took a pen and poured them out, okay, before him, but he refused to eat. Right, again, this is part of his ploy. And he's like, oh, uh, uh, you know, oh, I can't eat, uh, you know, whatever. And then, you know, he feigns this and, and pretends, right? I'm not saying, uh, have all the men, okay, have out all the men from me. Okay, so he sets up a situation now. None of the men are in the room, all right, in his chambers. And they went out every man from him. And Amnon said unto Tema, Bring the meat into the chamber that I may eat of thine hand. Okay, so now they are all alone. Okay, possibly maybe some of the other women are there, but uh, there's no one who's going to be able to stop him or to resist him physically. He tells Tema, right, bring the meat into the chamber, right, into his private quarters, to his bed. He said that I may eat out of thine hand. All right? So he said, you, you feed me. All right? And Tema took the cakes which she had made, all right, innocently, and she has no clue what's going on, all right? Uh, nor was there reason for her to suspect anything. He says, and brought them into the chamber, all right, to Amnon, her brother. Okay? So the, the idea, the, the, so the word chamber here, the idea of, you know, these are, uh, it's going to be uh, somewhere very private, very intimate, uh, the, you know, hence you get the word chambering or so, uh, because it has to, has something to do with the bed, right? So he, he's lying there, you know, whatever, he says, oh, come, can you come bring it to me, whoever, right? And so he's drawing her, imagine like a spider, right? Deeper and deeper into the web. Now look at verse 11. And when she had brought them onto him to eat, now notice he took hold of her, he grabs her, Right, he maybe he tries to embrace her or hold her or whatever and said unto her, Come lie with me, my sister. Okay, the word here has to do with it basically was his indecent proposal. All right, he tells her, Come lie down with me sexually. All right, let's, let's just have a good time here. And I want to note something here. That people are the most audacious when they know that they are alone or they are anonymous. When they know that no one's watching, right? Whether it is under the cloak, you know, cover of privacy or under the cloak of darkness, okay? Um, they, but the thing, what, what is the thing that they fear? They fear exposure of their deeds, right? That people will know what they do. And that's why um, being alone Right, being anonymous gives them a lot of courage. Now, Amnon could, in this setting, Amnon can, can now easily deny that he did anything, right? Because of the lack of witnesses. Okay, in this set, setup, okay, now, if you take this, if you read the text and assume, okay, that the two of them are alone, now here's the thing. Any complaint from Tema that, uh, concerning what happened, right, is basically his word against hers. Right? And he's going to be the future king. Who, who are they going to listen to? Okay, now, you put this in our modern day context, this is the stuff of sexual harassment, you know, issues and problems. Right? Why? Because, yeah, uh, someone who can abuse his power, his position, and his connections, who are they going to listen to? 
Uh, we don't know how old Tema is. We do know that she is unmarried. She's single. Possibly, you know, in her late teens even. Whereas uh, here, he is old, much older, much uh, well-respected. Now, who are they going to listen to? And so he has the cloak also of invincibility or immunity because of his position and power. And realize this, that the wicked, right? They fear exposure and accountability. That's why John 3.20 tells us this. For everyone that doeth evil, notice, hate the light. Right? They hate the light. They don't like the light. They don't like uh, coming into the light. They rather stay in the shadows. They stay in the darkness. It says, neither cometh to the light. Why? Lest his deeds should be reproved. Because if they come into the light, what happens is this. Whatever they do, their deeds will be exposed. Right? Beware. Because we see this today. Right? Beware of churches and leaders, especially people who have a dislike for accountability. Things that they do, meetings that they have, there's no documentation, no minutes. They're deadly afraid of any form of recording. Beware of those that, you know, can only speak boldly when there's no microphone. All right, there's no audio recording. Why? Because they do not want to be held accountable. Why? Because that gives them room to be able to flip-flop, to gaslight people. Because why? If you call them out and say, no, I didn't say that. Where God? Where God? Where's your proof? You know, I didn't say anything. And they will smirk at you. And I've seen this face. I've seen this before, firsthand. Okay, there's no place for that in the church of God. There's no call for that. No ever uh, with the children of light and those who walk with Christ in the light. How can we be people who can flip and flop like that? Like the Prata man. You know, you just keep flipping things around. All right? Where people can only do stuff where they, and they're very careful to make sure that there are no witnesses. And they operate in the shadows and in the darkness. Right, because if you find a church like that, right, or you find Christians like that, run. Run far away from them, have nothing to do with them because they are not of God. Right? Because you can see one thing about being a child of God and being, you know, okay, uh, okay, and being in Christ is that we love the light. Openness. Right? Truth. All those things matter. Because if you love the Lord, that is what you will love. And if you love that, you will love all those who love the Lord and who love the truth. There will be fellowship. There will be unity. Why? Around the truth and around light. Okay? But certainly never be around shadows and darkness and cloaks and masks. Okay? Now, we, we look at this situation, right? Here was a setup, a, a trap. Now, how, how did Joseph right, handle this right, in, in Genesis chapter 39? Now, Joseph found himself in this situation uh, where he was the victim of sexual harassment, right? And, and uh, inappropriate propositions, right? It says, and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife right, cast her eyes upon Joseph, right? So she... she took a liking to Joseph. She's been eyeing him. And then she came up to him and said, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master watered not what is with me in the house. And he had committed all that he had to my hand. Okay. Here, you know, for many as a slave, this would have been an Wonderful opportunity, right? Why? Because your master's wife takes a liking to you. Now, if she likes you, she's gonna, she is gonna favor you. She can, uh, if you do what she uh, makes her happy, uh, you do, you know, you 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 satisfy her. Uh, and if she says, okay, lie with me, then you you do it. Now, she can get you off work. She can, you know, she can say, hey, look, you don't have to work, right? You just have to accompany me, right? Uh, whatever. Now, she she can ply him with gifts. 
Now, there are a lot of benefits, a lot of advantages, but notice, but Joseph refused. Right? And then he points out, says he says to his master's wife, he said, Behold, my master, what if not what is with me in the house? Right? And he had committed all that he had to my hand. So, says he doesn't know what's happening at home because, right, I have a free hand, full autonomy. And then, he has also full authority. And because of that, now, they, uh, Joseph was not prepared to betray his master's trust. Look at the next two verses. There is none greater in this house than I. Right? Neither had he kept back anything from me but thee. The only thing that is out of bounds. Right? that Joseph cannot touch and cannot deal with is his master's wife. All right? It says, because thou art his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Now, he makes it clear. The first thing, all right, if he were to do this, is that it is a sin against God, not just a sin against man, not just a sin against, you know, his master or his master's wife. Okay? But, he acknowledges he is accountable. See, the thing about accountability is this. We are accountable to God first. You, there's no way you can truly be accountable to others if you're firstly not accountable to God. And here it says, how can I do this? Because it is a, a sin against God. And this is wickedness before the, the sight, in the sight of God. Right? And so it says, and it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her, to be uh, to lie with her or to be with her. Okay, so notice this. Now Joseph had full autonomy in his master's home. All right, he can do anything he wants. Now, just because you have full autonomy, all right, doesn't mean that you ought to do anything you like. All right, he's not going to betray his master's trust. Now he had full authority. Now that means he could do anything, and you know he doesn't have to answer. Practically, he doesn't have to answer to anybody. Yet, he continues to behave accountably in an accountable manner, right? Despite the lack of accountability measures, right? Now, think about this. Just because there aren't accountability measures doesn't mean that we are not accountable. And my point here is it begins with the attitude of our heart, right? Because accountability begins with our accountability towards God. You can have all the measures you want, all right? And a church can be so-called watertight with all the measures and you will still see if someone wants to circumvent this, they will always find a way. Why? Because it has to do with the attitude of the heart. Because if you do not have someone who is willing to be accountable, they'll find a way around whatever you put in place, okay? Um, you can put all the checks and balances, but someone who is not a trustworthy person they are going to find a way to defeat your measures. And so the thing is, it comes to the, the thing that we don't, very often we don't deal with is the character, right? And the attitude of the person. Okay? And so Joseph said, look, I, just because I can do anything I want, all the more, right? All the more I cannot betray my master's trust, Right? And as much as I can help myself to the food and other things in the home, the thing is, I'm not going to help myself to my master's wife. Here today, what do we see? We, we see um, beginning, that, and that the pattern, right? Beginning with men who pastor churches who uh, don't want to be accountable for how they deal with the finances of the church. They help themselves to, you know, the what is collected and all that. You can be sure of one thing, it doesn't stop there. At some point, they help themselves to the wives of the members. They help themselves to the sons and daughters. Why? Because a covetous heart is never satisfied. It is not just material things. Right? Because if it's just, ma just material things, you'll notice why was it in the, in the Ten Commandments, they talk about not coveting your, master, your neighbor's wife. Right, your neighbor servants and you know their neighbor's things. Okay, the, the, this heart, the condition of the heart is important. And 
um, one that will not, you know, gets drunk on the power and the position, thinking that, you know, we're, we're, we're immune, you know, and we're, that, uh, we're not accountable to anyone, you know, um, that's going to set, set that person up for a fall. Now, Joseph's resolve was he did not listen to her, he did not sleep with her, and he avoided contact with her. In spite of her persistence over and over again, but the problem was this, he could not avoid being in the house because of his work. And so here she waited for the right moment to ambush, to blindside him, right? While he was working along, alone, okay, when he was in the home and she set it up such that she would be alone with him. Right, look at verse Genesis 39 again, uh, verse 11 and 12. And it came to pass, about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And notice, she had kind of prepared for this, right? And there was none of the men of the house there within. Now, same thing again, right? Just like what Amnon did, he made sure none of the men are around. Why? Because that way, what happens? Nobody can step in to stop this thing, okay? At the same time, okay, in the case of Amnon, his idea was that since he's the only man there, he can overpower his sister, and do whatever he wants to her. In this case here, um, if anything happens, she can always turn around and say, hey, you know, it was Joseph who did this, not me. All right, and she can cover herself. Now here, this is verse 12, and she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. Okay, and the thing that Joseph did was, and he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. All right, now he got out. Now, here's the thing. Some have preach this and say, oh, see, the problem was this. Joseph left his garment. He left his, a piece of his clothing. Now, Joseph got out as, as soon as possible. Okay? As quickly, immediately. Not a second longer. Right? He got out with whatever he had. But she turned around, used this to accuse him. Right? Or trying to sexually assault her. Realize this, it is difficult, even impossible to get out of a compromising position, which is why sometimes the only and the best solution is to avoid getting into such a situation. Why? Because if, if this was an innocent situation, well and good. But the problem is this, if you are being set up, the wicked will always find a way to lay a trap for you. Even more so if... Uh, not just you're not just innocent, but you're naive. You're simple-minded, right? You operate and work on the assumption that nothing bad can ever happen. There are no you operate on the foolish notion that there are no such thing as liars or deceivers in this world or in our churches or whatever. And and you know what? If that's what what you believe, you are very clearly out of touch with reality. In fact, you're out of touch with the Bible. Right? Because the scriptures give us warning after warning. But here's the thing. One, there's a trap. Once the trap is sprung, it's too late to get out of the trap. At which time only God can deliver you out of the trap. And so, you know, the best thing is never to get yourself into a compromising situation and to have the wisdom and discernment to recognize that you are walking into something like that and then not to take the next step. Okay, I know, but it's not going to work if uh, you are a cultural Christian where all you do is, oh, no, 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 uh, actually my life, my Christian life is so simple, I don't think at all. Uh, well, I'm sorry, because that's not scriptural. The word of God is given to us so that we can consider, ponder our path, right? To be able to make right judgment and to evaluate things clearly, seeing things the way God will see them. Because why? Right, he tells us, how to look at things from the scriptures. So many, you know, have this unthinking, mystical kind of faith. Okay? And the Bible will call you simple. When the Bible calls you simple or simple-minded, it's not a compliment. It means you're very foolish. All right? Look at 2 Timothy 4, verse 17 to 18, it says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Now, here, 
Paul, when he was on trial, weapons and all men had forsaken him, right? He was then he was left on his own. It says, even in that situation, and he was being set up over and over again and um and falsely accused by all men. Here it says, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. But notice his focus, right? It was on preaching the gospel to everyone rather than just trying to defend himself. It says that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. Notice, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul's confidence was in the Lord who can protect him and preserve him and keep him from every evil work. Right? But rest assured one thing here. Now Paul did not have a carefree and comfortable life. As many Christians would like to think that that's what they're entitled to. Instead, there was trouble at every turn and his life was constantly in danger and yet it was the Lord that delivered him out of the mouth of the lion. Why? Because uh, if he was sentenced to death, um, it would he would have been ex- executed in the arena, right? have fed to the lions, right? as entertainment to the Romans. Now, there's a Lord that delivered him from every evil work, from every evil person, and then preserving him until the day of his, right, when, when he enters into the kingdom. Now, look at 2 Samuel, verse 12 and 13, because here, Tema is stuck in the situation, and so we see the deferring of the proposition, right? Now, she is powerless physically, She's trying to find a way out. And so here's what she does. She tries to buy time. She tries to defer this thing. And she answered him, Nay, nay, my brother, do not force me. Right? For no such thing ought to be done in Israel. He said, do not thou this folly. And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as, uh, right, as one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. Okay, so she she tries to make this argument now. Okay, that um here right he tells her okay, she tells him, all right, he says, please don't do this. All right, she begs him, right, not to do this. Right, and, and then he says, Look, don't force me and she, in other words, okay, now Tamar understands Amnon's intentions at this point. Right? It's very clear to her what he's about to do. All right? He's going to have sex with her one way or another. Whether she's willing or not, this is going to happen. And she's begging him, don't do this. All right? Don't force yourself on me. And then she argues, right, that this ought this is ought to be, in fact, something unheard of in Israel, especially by a brother. Therefore, no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Right? And it says, do not doubt this folly. Okay? Now, here, um, oh, uh, okay, I'm just kind of looking up the word. Uh, Alright, so, it says, okay, don't do this folly. And then, you know, this this whole thing is a is not a, a don't do something, this despicable, this disgraceful act, right? It says, and and I said, so whither shall I cause my shame to go? Right, because if he does this to her, says she will never be able to put away the shame, of what is done to her. At the same time, she points out, right? It says, Amnon also will be known to all of Israel, okay, as a vile fool. Right? It says, as one of the fools in Israel. Now, when you look at the word, it's very interesting because it is literally, right, the word Nabal. Okay? Remember that the character Nabal, uh, okay, who was the husband of Abigail and who mocked and insulted David and David almost uh, wanted was going to kill him actually now 
That was his name. Okay, and literally, this word in Hebrew means fool. All right? Amnon will become a person like that, a forward person. Okay? Now, what Tamar was trying to do is she was trying to buy time. All right? She's saying, look, uh, let me, why don't we do this? All right? Speak to the king. Because the king can decide on this matter. If he gives permission and authority, you know what? Uh, we can be together. All right? Let's get our father's approval and then, you know, and then we move on from that. But let's do it the proper way. Okay? Now, she's hoping, right? Tactic, hoping to stall for time, calm him down, all right? And if she can defer this, it's possible he might change his mind. Now, realize this. She's physically weaker. Now, she's at a very severe disadvantage, right? There's nobody else there to help her. If she screams, no one's going to be able to come to a rescue. Worse, if she actively resists, she could be very badly hurt or in or killed. All right? So, um, you know, this is a very, very dangerous situation for her. Now, when you look at the law of Moses, what do we see? You know, the law of Moses uh, condemns, okay, the sin of incest. All right? Leviticus uh, 20 verse 17 and if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, notice whether it is your uh, immediate sibling, right? Immediate uh, sister, for instance, or it's your half sister. And it says here, it shall take her, says, and shall see her and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness. It is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He had uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. Right? What about in the case of rape? Now, there's also a responsibilities and restitution uh, if someone should actually commit the vile act of rape. Deuteronomy 22 verse 29. Then the man that lay with her, he shall give unto the damsel's father 50 shekels of silver and she shall be his wife because he had humbled her. But then notice there's a condition here. He may not put her away all his days. There's no possibility of divorce. Right? Because of what he has done. Okay? The woman all right, has the right to refuse marriage to such a person. But this is the right thing since he did this to her he ought to marry her, all right? But she can refuse and the father says, no, we're not going to do this, all right? But he still has to make restitution. But you notice, he is responsible for what he's done. He, he will have to pay according to the law of Moses. Now, you know, I would point out one thing. David failed to see the risk, all right? He of all people ought to know, you know, what goes on inside the heart of a man, okay? Especially when he's alone with a woman. And he failed to see the risk and endangered his daughter by putting her into a very dangerous or compromising situation. Now, Proverbs 22 verse 3 makes it very clear. A prudent man foreseeth the evil, notice, and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. All right? Let me, and that is a prudent man. You see the possibility of something going wrong. What do you do? You take steps to avoid it. Right, to prevent it from happening. You are proactive. Right? You are not a reactive person. You proact. Is it but weapons? The simple? Which is why it's so ridiculous, this mindset. Right? It's a simple pass on and are punished. Right? There are going to be bad consequences. And yet so many think that they are very spiritual. They say, oh, no, I don't think so much. You know, my, my, my Christian life, very simple one. No, you're not scriptural. That's all. Right? You're going with eyes closed, ears shut, and then you know you just blunder on. It's just, and the simple, they will pass on and are punished. Because why? You are foolish. And you choose to be a fool. Now, here's the problem. Amnon's trap was set. Okay? The trap was also sprung. Both David and Amnon, they lusted after someone. Both used deception as a cover. Both laid the trap and said, Set up, okay, set up an innocent person and put them into great danger 
in the case of Uriah, you know, he died as a result. Okay, and realize this, there is a difference between being innocent and pure versus being someone who is simple-minded and naive, all right? Because that is not, it is a negative, all right, spiritual condition, all right? Being innocent, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Or pure, all right? As, as every, okay, young woman like uh, Tema ought to be, all right? It tells us uh, she's a virgin, okay? That was a, a positive attribute, it is a virtuous attribute, whereas our culture today, uh, you know, thinks that, you know, a, a, a woman like that, nobody wants her, right? She's undesirable. That's why she, you know, that's why she's sexually inexperienced, right? Uh, she, that's why she's still a virgin. You know, um, so much has changed just in the last, you know, 20, 30 years that uh, anyone who is a virgin today is actually looked down upon by others. And yet, uh, here, Realize, God intends actually for us to remain sexually pure. And when two people are married and they, you know, in, in the confines of the privacy of the marriage bed, you know, between husband and wife, they still maintain their purity. Okay, without any, without a third party coming in. Now, we're going to see here, all these things that David had done are starting to come back to him. Right, in a very similar way. And when all this comes into full bloom, he's also going to experience the pain right, that he had caused to others. Now, as we close here, may God give us uh, wisdom and understanding right, and, and let us be wise to ponder right, all these things. Let's pray. Father, thank you for even uh, this time of the word. I pray and ask right now that you just continue open our eyes of an understanding and then Lord um, may you have just have mercy on us uh, help us to realize even the the extent and the depth of what a heart that is in darkness can how far this, how, how low it can go and Lord we thank you even for saving us and for your grace I pray Lord that your light will continue to shine so brightly in us that we will see and will expose every wicked way that we can hand that over to you Lord that uh, we can surrender that and Lord may you uh, be pleased to just uh, cleanse us of all unrighteousness continue to sanctify us help us Lord to grow and Lord to be mindful and to be wise also even as we walk in this dark and this very wicked world and culture that we live in and so Father we just uh, thank you for this time in the word and Lord uh, we just uh, we just ask that you can just continue to be with us during this meeting and we ask this in Christ's name pray. Amen.